delighted to be moderating this panel, which I think I'm going to learn a lot from, actually, myself, um, as a journalist and as someone who tends to come at these topics from um, more of a sort of just-in-time perspective. Um, I think it's going to be really interesting to reconnect this idea of the history of our country, the founding of this country, constitutional democracy, and anti-monopoly and corporate power. So. Um, Welcome to you both, Sabil and Joey. And let me start uh, by asking you all the same question. And it's a question I actually think about a lot. I have started in recent years using the term political economy, like all the time when I'm writing. And I find that I'm one of the few journalists writing about economics and business and the financial markets that do. And I, th I think that there's something important there. And so I guess I would ask you, and maybe Joey, you can start, why did we stop using that term? When did we start using it? Why did we stop using it? And what do you make of that? Great. Thank you so much uh, for uh, that great question. And also thanks so much to Barry and everyone who organized this amazing event. Uh, so political economy, and I was sort of ticking off in my mind every time <coughs> I heard that term today, several times from Barry, Christina, Rara, uh, you know, we've seen, we've heard it a lot. Uh, but you're right that you're one of the relatively few uh, journalists who are who are doing it. This term goes way back. If you were in the 18th century and you were talking about all the stuff that today sounds like economics, prices, wages, rents, you know, capital versus labor, conflicts, any of these topics, uh, they were all political economy. And what that term captured, I think, is that politics and economics are not two separate things. They are so deeply intertwined that it's more sensical to talk to, about them as one thing. Um, and all the way through the 19th century, there weren't economists and political scientists. There were people who did political economy. That's what it was. Um, and that's even as you had the precursors of modern economics. Uh, political economy was how everybody would have understood what they were talking about. So the rise of economics as an academic discipline in the 20th century is what eventually got us away from political economy. And in particular, I would highlight, I know this is kind of a, because today is about antitrust, this is a gathering where there's a lot of focus on the 1980s mm. as this moment of, you know, kind of takeover by neoliberal new ways of thinking. But to me, the moment, if you're looking at what happened to political economy, it's really the 50s when mm. you have a kind of rising science with claims to kind of mathematical precision of a kind of Keynesian kind, which mm -hmm. Keynes himself, by the way, was a little skeptical about all the mathematical precision, thought this was not really, you know, quite the way the world worked. Uh, but anyway, this, this economic science in the 1950s offered something to politicians and to people who wanted to argue about the economy. And what it offered was the possibility of an apolitical, technocratic way of talking about all the questions that used to be political economy. And that was appealing because this was the Cold War. <clears throat> and in the 1950s, there was a lot of anxiety about the kind of lefty things that some people were saying that sounded a little communist-like to uh, their opponents. And you had a kind of consolidation. I don't really think it's right to, pl to blame the right only for this. You had a consolidation on the left, too of a kind of new liberal consensus that all the stuff, like take monetary policy, I know that's way afield for us, but that used to be a big fight about whether the money was gonna be concentrated in New York or whether it was gonna flow out to the hinterlands. You know, that was like massive 19th century political fight and constitutional fight. Um, but in the 1950s, it turns into economics and we're still digging out from under that. And I think it's just, it's terrific that uh, that we're beginning to see a revival of the term political uh, economy, which when when my co-author Willie Forbath and I started working on on this book, and thank you for the generous mentions of this book, The Anti-Oligarchy Constitution, we've been working on it for a bunch of years. And when we started, there really weren't that many people talking about political economy. But now, it's sort of out last year, there's, there's, um, there's actually a lot of people in this room and elsewhere who are, who are using that term, and um, yeah, I think that's important. I wanna, before we move on to Sabil, I wanna amplify two points you just made that I think are very important. One, there's often, I find, when there are big histor uh, historical tipping points in, um, in the political economy, it's often an odd mix of bedfellows on both sides 
of the aisle that bring that to pass. And when you're talking about monetary policy, it's worth noting that both sides of the aisle wanted um, the markets to take over from, you know, the kind of guns and butter debates that might have been had earlier. That's something that people often lose. I would also just something I think about when you when you go back and say, you know, early political economy thinkers never thought about markets existing in isolation. I, I'm often struck. Um, and I think about Adam Smith, you know, kind of the, one of the fathers of uh, of modern economics that said you needed three things for a well-functioning market. Um, equal access to information, a shared understanding of what the transaction is, um, and a shared moral framework. And none of those things are in operation in, you know, many, many transactions that we could be having in our lives today. So that's that's worth thinking about too. So Sabia, let me let me then toss the same question to you. Why do we not talk about political economy and how do we think about it better and more? Yeah, great. Uh, thanks, Ron, and, and just such a pleasure to be on the sharing this stage with both of you um, at this great conference, thanks to uh, Open Markets and everybody. Um, so maybe piggybacking off of you know what Joey set up and to your further question, Rana, I mean, I think part of the stakes of what's lost is exactly that sense of what is the shared moral vision of what a good society looks like. And that's not to say we have a consensus view, but that those are the stakes that we're fighting over. So part of uh, the political valence of a, a technocratized notion of markets and economy is that it takes a lot of those deeper questions off the table, right? Because now all of these questions about who's actually in charge, what does it mean to provide individuals and communities with the kind of resources and capabilities everyone needs to flourish and thrive, to take on the kinds of systemic inequities that Rashad talked about, you know, a couple hours ago, for example, uh, those questions get collapsed down into technical questions about consumer welfare, about price, about, you know, kind of how markets ought to work. Um, but they're kind of sterilized of some of those moral stakes. And so one way I think about political economy as a, as a concept, you know, as we're bringing it back, is um, it's really about who controls, period. Mm -hmm. Who's in, who controls those systems that we depend on, right? Whether it's water or electricity or um, access to travel or, or information, when Jonathan's talking about sort of the arteries of information and why sort of the publishing industry is so critical for, for antitrust efforts, right? Mm -hmm. It's because that's one of those critical industries, those critical sort of uh, resources for a democracy. So political economy to me is really about that moral question of who's in control and what ends are they pursuing? And how do then we as a de democratic society create the rules and systems that make that ensure that it serves all of us, that our markets are serving all of us, serving the common good, that our politics are serving all of us, serving the democratic good. Okay, so that's a really important point too, and and you're touching on I think some of the really rich conversation that Christina and Luigi had about about power. Really, power exists. Like, get real, power exists, um, and those that are setting what seem to be very simplistic scientific rules are still self-interested parties. We all have interests in this, you know, large. Um, swamp that we <laughs> live in, sometimes literally and figur figuratively. Um, so one of the things that um, I often find difficult when I'm trying to sort of bat away neoliberal critiques um, and, and, you know, shareholder value, consumer price, these concepts seem kind of simple or they seem, they seem easy. They're easy to understand. They have become e relatively easy to explain, although not fully as we see. Um, how can how can those of us who are interested in the political economy in a richer, broader sense, and and those of you that understand its rootings in constitutional democracy, explain our positions better? Um, how would you put the point simply? Um, I, and what I'm getting at here is, I think in some ways it's easier to fight one unified field theory with another. And, and one of the challenges, both the opportunities and challenges of this movement is bringing together a lot of diverse points, but now messaging them in a way that people can understand. <laughs> Don't pass the buck. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sibylle, you can uh, go. Great. I, I, I'll take a first crack at it. Well, um, I think one reason why I'm drawn to this frame of, of who governs is because that, that really is what it boils down to, to me, is that it's very simple. Like, I think the, the moral argument is very simple, that if we believe in democracy and we believe that every one of us matters equally, then uh, you don't get to dictate the lives of whole communities, whole uh, regions, whole cities without some really serious checks on your power. That's what it means to be a democracy. And if you think about the list of policy ideas, for example, that Senator Warren walked through or the mm -hmm. different industries that you walked through, each one of those was about zeroing in on a set of corporate actors 
who control a thing with, with impunity uh. and control a thing that we all need, right? Electricity, water, finance, uh, I'm kind of like the list of industry, transportation, the list of industries you mentioned. It's not a coincidence. These are all things that we need to thrive, to live full lives and to be a part of our whole society. And there, each of these industries are controlled by a set of actors who are using it to ex extract rents and, and, uh, and return, <clears throat> not necessarily to serve all of us. And you don't get to do that in a democracy without mm -hmm. real checks on your power, without real accountability. And, and like for me, that's, that's the bottom line. It's not about markets, it's not about government, it's, you know, whether you're political actors or economic actors. Yep. In a democracy, you, owe, you answer to us, we the people, and we need to build rules and systems to make sure that you answer to us. Checks and that's and it. Yeah, yeah, checks and balances. Joey, yeah, go ahead. No, this is this is great. And and Seville's uh, terrific book, Democracy Against Domination, is actually picking up this big rhetorical frame, which is also, I think, a frame of this conference. I mean, I see we're, <laughs> the Democratic Republic here. The idea is we should think about democracy not just as a people vote and, you know, it's not a monarchy or a dictatorship, that's a pretty thin starting point for democracy. For most of American history, most sides in the various long running debates about how our republic was supposed to be governed shared an understanding that there was a political economy undergirding democracy. And so how you boil it down, I mean, the reason I defer to the beginning of this question is I do not claim to be good at boiling things down into a into a, a one sentence message. It's definitely not my specialty. But I think the idea that um, it's not, um, you know, uh, just about economics and concentrated versus dispersed wealth. I mean, that's one good thing, but it's really about um, democracy versus oligarchy. Mm. That's the frame mm. that I think, you know, uh, I can't tell you how effective it's going to be, but it's one that I think resonates the most with mm. American traditions of fighting about matters like what we're talking about today. Yeah, just Jump quickly in. to piggyback off of that, I think, um, you know, in the neoliberal imagination, there's the economy exists out there and is self self regulating and self sustaining. And then Government is over here and sometimes does stuff. And it's the, bur the burden is on the government to prove why its intervention is warranted. Um, but if you take sort of what Joey just said, we're being governed all the time. But we're not always being governed by forces that are actually accountable to us. Mm. So the, in the workplace, monop monopoly uh, or oligarchic uh, markets that control, you know, our systems of access, but often from behind the scenes, like we heard, you know, from Senator Warren and others, right? These are, these are forms of government, as in they are governing, they're setting rules, they're setting standards, they're deciding who wins and who loses, but it's not always in a transparent and democratically accountable way. Mm -hmm. So it's not a question about like government versus markets. We're being governed all the time. It's a question of who are we being governed by and what rules are they subject to, if any. That's that's such an interesting point. Um, it, you know, it puts to mind two things I've been thinking about recently. One, I was speaking to a foreign policy analyst about the U.S.-China conflict and, you know, talking about you know, essentially who, whose system is going to win out? Who's, you know, uh, how is this going to play out? And he said, you know, I think really what people don't talk enough about is it's going to be who can manage their elites better, who can manage vested interests better. Um, and that's kind of what you're getting at with democracy v. oligopoly. And it's also worth noting there was an interesting um, UNCTAD, UN, the UN Development um, and Trade Group, did an interesting study looking at where the wealth accrued during the last half century of neoliberalism, and it was basically multinational corporations and um, the Chinese state, more or less. I would say Chinese labor, but it because labor has been suppressed. So that gets back to this um, this this sort of bargain amongst monopoly powers, in a way, um, be they the state or the company. Um, all right, with that little time out, but we're here, we're here to connect the dots. So um, let me go back to your areas of specialty. Um, and, and I'd love to walk through some of the high points, um, be it the Sherman Act, be it other, the other historical turning points that you see as important in thinking about anti-monopoly policy today. So Joey, why don't you start? Sure. So, so I do think, you know, when I was thinking about this, this uh, conference today and my, you know, relationship to, to it, and I think it's important to go back in American history, before you even had uh, 
trusts to be anti. You know, <coughs> there are, there are versions of anti-monopoly policy uh, or or predecessors of it that stretch all the way back to the founding of the republic. And I think what's what's the most vivid uh, example from the very beginning to me is uh, is really about land. Because that's where the wealth was. That's where the economic power was at the founding. And, you know, the thing that struck me most in, in learning more about that in, in writing this, this book with Willie Forbath is that um, there was a widely shared, there were a lot of debates about what to do about it, but there's a widely shared understanding at the founding and before that if you started to have too much land concentrated in too few landowners, you weren't going to have a republic. Mm. That wasn't a republic. It was actually some other form that was too much concentrated wealth. And so every state constitution, predating even the federal constitution, every state constitution came up with strategies to end primogenitor by which big estates are passed you know, to the oldest son, instead break them up, and uh, to end entail, whereby land kind of stays with the rich family even as other people live on it. Um, Thomas Jefferson said you can't invent too many devices for subdividing property. His plan for Virginia had all kinds of, you know, he had all kinds of ideas. Maybe we should tax the rich, you know, big land holdings more than the small land holdings. Maybe we should, he suggested, give 50 acres to anybody who, uh, any white man who doesn't have it at the start. Uh, so, you know, there was this idea that what you needed for a republic, because this is an agrarian society, was everybody having their small plot of productive land. And many of the constitutional fights of the first really, you know, 60 or 70 years of the republic are uh, debates about how to achieve that. Uh, the, other, the other moment that I think deserves a lot of focus prior to, you know, the Sherman Act and everything that came after, uh, which was really a response to the rise of national corporations, uh, the other moment that I think we need to focus on a lot in this conversation is Reconstruction, because the Republicans who were trying to build the South into what they saw as a republic, mm. they weren't at all sanguine that, you know, today their amendments have been so thinned out. This is the current conservative Supreme Court imagines that Reconstruction was basically just, you know, we're going to have non-discrimination provisions. Um, so that black people will be, you know, they'll have non-discrimination and they'll be treated the same as white people. That was not what the Reconstruction Republicans had in mind. They thought, uh, and, you know, Thaddeus Stevens said, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to mangle the quote, but, but that uh, how can, that the whole, the whole social fabric of the South must be changed. How can Republican institutions exist in a mingled society of nabobs and serfs. Mm. You know, he thought the whole political economy is going to need to shift so that we break up these slaveocratic, you know, plantations owned by a few rich slave owners and distribute the land to the freedmen. Otherwise, it's not going to work. We're not going to have a democracy coming out the other end. He was right about that. And the radical Republicans who wanted to do even more to break up the plantations than we did and to distribute 40 acres and a mule, they were right that that kind of shift in the fundamental political economy of the South was necessary if you were going to do the thing that they were trying to do, which was to turn a fundamentally non-democratic society into an mm. actual republic or what we today would say is a democracy. So I've talked too much. So I'll just mm. highlight, start with those two, but there are, uh, there are a number. Sabiel, do you want to jump in on this? Yeah. Um, maybe I'll just add, to, I mean, I agree with everything Joey said, and we'll just add, add a few other sort of like touchstones along the way. Um, first with, with Reconstruction, I think that's exactly right. And, you know, people forget that in that brief moment uh, after uh, kind of during Radical Reconstruction in the 1870s, that's when you get the first wave of national civil rights legislation, right? And it's not a coincidence that the, that's among the first targets for those, that national civil rights legislation was the right to travel, the, the notion of uh, that public um, common carriers could not discriminate on basis of race. And when you think about this idea of kind of uh, control of those essential mm. goods and services that we need to be a society, like that was front and center, right? Mm. It's only after the Supreme Court decides to wreck all of those statutes in the 1880s that then we're in this long century of Jim Crow that then kind of 
you know, requires a second reconstruction of the of the 1960s sort of come come back to level, mm. right? Or not even or try to come back to level. So I think it's reconstruction is one window. Progressive era is another window that's been talked about a lot already, sort of late 1800s, early 1900s. That's when the Sherman Act comes out. That's when the FTC is created, right? Sort of all of these institutions we're now trying to sort of breathe new life back into come from that period. Um, and then I do think the second reconstruction is uh, of the civil rights era is worth kind of putting in the pantheon because I think we tend to read the political economy out of civil rights, right? But uh, the civil rights movement had a theory of economic power that was part of the argument for real, genuine democracy. Mm-hmm. And I think sort of we, we do ourselves a disservice to read that out of the story. Uh, that is 100% the case. And actually, one of the things I really like about this event today is that we're starting to kind of connect the dots between some of these topics in really powerful ways. Um, and on that note, let me let me open up kind of another topic, which is um, what is what is economic democracy? And um, actually, I want to read a quote from um, Joey and and ask if there's a, if and maybe I'll turn this to you, Joey. Is there any conflict between, as you would put it, a robust constitutional politics <laughs> of race and sex equality and a constitutional politics of fighting class domination? Yeah, thanks for the question. And I think it's literally 180 degrees off from there being a conflict. Like actually, the only way that successfully you can pursue either of those goals is to pursue them together. And this is, I think, the central insight that got lost of Reconstruction is that these things go together. So the, the tradition that, um, that, uh, that Willie and I try to trace in this book, the Democracy of Opportunity tradition, we call it, we take that name from, from an FDR speech, but it stretches back. And you know this, this tradition, it circles around three ideas. One is anti-oligarchy. You can't have too much concentrated economic power. Another is you need a broad middle class. And the last is that you need it to be racially inclusive. And these ideas only work when they go together. And we see that uh, both in the collapse of the progressive uh, reform movement, where basically, uh, you know, Southern white supremacists successfully divide. And, you know, I mean, this is such a familiar move to everyone here because it, it's not just in the late 19th century, it runs all the way through. Successfully divide poor white people against poor black people and thereby undermine the possibility of uh, an actual progressive movement succeeding in building a majority. Um, There's, uh, you know, I guess much later and maybe a little more controversially, I'll say, there's an effort uh, by some liberals in the 1960s uh, to enact race-based anti-discrimination protections without listening to activists like Bayard Rustin, I would particularly highlight, and also Martin Luther King, who believed that you had to uh, connect these new anti-discrimination laws with interventions in the political economy so that there would be the jobs that uh, were trying to create the anti-discrimination protections so that those jobs could stop being you know, all white bastions. Instead, what we got was kind of liberal anti-discrimination protection, which obviously, you know, I'm a lawyer, I'm a law student, I was a law student. We we all like get these these narratives of the centrality of these anti-discrimination laws of the 1960s to justice of all kinds, and they are central. But you know, there were voices at the time who were saying, this is not going to work because we're going to have uh, you know, the the right on an equal basis to you know, these union training programs and things that are actually going to disappear because mm-hmm. we're not doing anything to keep the underlying jobs, uh, you know, that are good jobs existing. So you have sort of a shrinking pie. So anyway, I think this is a, another um, kind of important moment where we can really see in the long arc of American history, it does not work to pull these apart. Mm-hmm. Um, it only works to be trying to intervene in the political economy uh, to achieve both uh, racial justice and inclusion and a broad, open middle class and stopping oligarchy. Because otherwise, it's just, um, yeah. yeah, Give a clap to that. 
All right, let me ask a couple more questions and then maybe we'll open it up for five or 10 minutes to the, to the, um, to the audience. Um, this is maybe a little semantic and wonky, but, but hey, you're a wonky crowd. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm often struck uh, by how certain CEOs, certain uh, parts of corporate America, when confronted with some of these seemingly new ideas, will say, oh, that's hipster antitrust, that's, you know, what, whatever the slur is, that this is a trend, it's a fad, it's going to go away. Um, clearly, that's not the case based on what you're saying historically, but how do you think about this anti-monopoly moment? Is it radical? Is it conservative? Is it progressive? Does it matter? Sabil? Yeah. Um, uh, I think I was at that conference uh, <laughs> at a, doing a panel with Lena, among others, where we were <laughs> the young guns on the panel and, and yeah. other co-panelists were like, basically sort of made that comment as a way to sort of be like, oh, you kind of young yeah. folks don't know what you're talking about. Go to the um, I, you know, I, I'm the first to say I, there's lots to learn, but... Um, Right. I mean, that was a, that was an attempt at a power move. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, it's so interesting because right? I think it, like there are ways in which what we're talking about is like extremely radical and transformative relative to like ev everything that's come in the last 40 years. And then as Joey's talking about, right, it's ways in which this is like this is actually the longstanding old tradition. And it's the last 40 years that was the aberration in, in a lot of ways. So, you know, I, I think bo both can be true, uh, you know, and, and I think that's sort of that dual nature of it is is why it, one of the reasons why you see kind of so much energy, right? Mm. Because, you know, people, uh, people, are, I, I mean, I believe in democracy in part because I think people are really smart. And I think we, mm. like, I think we, the public are really smart. And they know, people know that the system is not working in any of the ways it purports to work. And so there's a way in which sort of um, uh, offering a radical critique of, of what's, that's a break from the last 40 years is the only way to actually have resonance because it's the only thing that's true to people's lived experience. Mm. And then the tradition that Joey's talking about is a way of saying that, you know, this is not so new that we don't know what we're doing. Mm. That doesn't mean that you, you like make it up on the spot, you know, facts matter and research matters. But I think this is both like, we want it to be a decisive break from the past and we want to draw on this rich tradition that, you know, Joey's talking about. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was just saying, I, I agree <coughs> with all that. I think that's all terrific. And there's, there's something, um, kind of amazing about the fact that it really is radical today to talk in ways that were kind of standard, conventional wisdom, mm. normal talk, even into the early 1950s. I mean, I'm not a sort of deep historian of antitrust, but I've now read a lot of it. And when you look at you know the debates in Congress about there was a minor antitrust law passed in the early 50s, Seller Kefauver Act, you see what, what the, uh, what the um, people who were debating that were saying, and it was all about, you know, what about the small producer? What about the small shop owner, you know, who's not going to be in charge anymore because some bigger company? It was not about consumer <laughs> surplus. So it is radical today, but the only reason that it's radical today to talk about anything but consumer surplus is because of the amazing radicalism of, uh, of what happened in the second half of the 20th century in the other direction. So I think we can, we can be quite comfortable with going back to something that is in, a, in its way quite uh, conservative. You know, just one, one thought to amplify that. I was reading recently um, some work about the founding of um, the modern MBA program in America, which was pushed, I mean, talk about 1950s political economy, was pushed in part by corporate foundations as a way of countering what was perceived to be a threat of um, socialism mm -hmm. in the Cold War. So... How about that for power in the political economy? Um, let's open it up maybe for one or two questions, and I have a final thought. There's a question back here, the gentleman in the black, and then off to the um, off to the my right there. Do we have a mic? Yeah, we got a mic. Or just uh, shout. We're pretty. There we go. There we go. Hi, uh, Max Moran, Revolving Door Project. Uh, I really, really appreciated the uh, conversation about how like, the language of economics sort of supplanted the language of political economy. Um, one thing that always sort of strikes me about that is like, uh, econ uh, like economic language and, and ec economistic reasoning like, a, a lot of times like, invokes like, an idea of science. It invokes an idea of like, absolute certainty. Mm -hmm. uh, like, you know, you can't do this because we know for a fact that this will happen. Whereas like, political economy is more about saying, well, yeah, there's trade-offs no matter what you do. Like, you know, economics is supposed to be the study of trade-offs. And the way that we decide which of those trade-offs we're going to take 
uh, is through our values and is through our, our beliefs and, and through politics and so on. Uh, I wonder if you can speak at all about sort of like uh, the ways that sort of like a language of total certainty and a language of mm. scientific certainty uh, plays a role in all of that. That's a fascinating question. Either of you want to field that? Yeah, th uh, well, just uh, take it. St I mean, th so that's great um, and great to see you. I think uh, part of what's so fascinating to me about um, the kind of economistic uh, language discourse that we're talking about, it is si it, it trades both on uh, uh, simplicity and on complexity. So by that, what I mean is, right, it, you, it, it will, uh, you will often see that one move will be to say, oh, this is really complicated. Your kind of silly notion that uh, you could break up concentrations and have that work out for you, like, oh, how naive. <laughs> um, and so like, it's like, oh, it's complicated, trust us. But at the same time, it's like, oh, this is very simple, right? Like it, if the prices go down, if the prices don't go up, then there's, there's no problem. So what, you know, what are you talking about, right? And, and so there's, there's a way in which it's, it's the, that discourse is trying to have it both ways. Um, and you know, the two can play at that game, right? It yeah. is very simple. <laughs> Who's in charge, and like, who are they serving? And it is complicated. Like, we still want, you know, Jonathan is, and his and his team to like figure out, like, on the facts, like, what you know, how to prosecute a case. And, yeah. Um, and so, like, both things can be that's, true. That's a great answer. Did you, can we take sure, one yeah, more question? Ahead. Okay, I think there was one over here on the on my right. Hi, my name is Megan. Um, I flew in from Atlanta today. Um, I'm so happy with the panel discussion. It was very relevant to the South. Um, can you explain how the political economy and racial injustice are intertwined um, and how they rose up in America from the 50s to the 60s and how it's relevant to the grassroots organizations that are um, focusing on developing the democracy? Love that question. Joey? Sure, yeah. No, it's just a terrific <laughs> question. And there's so much to say. We could do a whole panel, a whole nother, you know, hour on it. And I feel like you know the the short answer um i guess is that is that from the beginning of the country there's been deeply a deep intertwining of any questions of political economy with specifically questions of racial uh injustice and the uh fight against a kind of in the early part of the country is of the country's history against a slaveocracy or a slave power is partly a fight about political economy. In fact, it's it's mostly the substance of the main fight that we had about political economy. And once Reconstruction was defeated by the kind of white supremacist forces of a century and a thirty, you know, 130, 140 years ago, you know, you had a South that was trying to come up with ways ways to, as as one opponent put it, re-insurf mm. the population who you know had had formerly been enslaved. So. I'm going way back into history, and I know your question was really about today. And I feel like the um, the essential work, uh, and I really appreciated the way the way uh, Rashad Robinson earlier was kind of trying to string this together. Uh, the the essential work today to connect the problem of racial inequality and injustice and the sort of gaps in wealth. Uh, and in political power that come from the fact that you have this kind of long-running oligarchy in the South that never has completely been uprooted mm. uh, is kind of the beginning of, of uh, to my mind, uh, of understanding where uh, people's uh, energies need to be focused today in, in both of these areas. So... Um, I don't think it's easy to draw those connections always, but I do think when you start to look at, you know, at, at who some of our kind of leading political families and still running things in the South are and how mm. there's been a kind of, I mean, I'm from Texas. I uh, know how some of this kind of <clears throat> people who are, who are running things in many places are are related not ideologically, but just actually directly, they are the descendants of the people who were running things 100 years earlier sometimes. I think there's um, a lot to be said and thought about how uh, uprooting old forms of political economy to build a genuine mm -hmm. multiracial democracy is a goal that, um, you know, I mean, the one thing we can be confident about, uh, about of that goal is that it's been... Um, it's been necessary for a long time, and a lot of people have worked on it and framed it that way. And one thing I'll say without getting too, you know, political for this kind of event is that the uh, 
the one, you know, slightly hopeful note, I guess, is that this is the first time since uh, Reconstruction, really, uh, that we have a political party existing in the United States that is um, at least on some level, and it's a messy coalition, you know, for both racial and economic justice, and that mm. does not have at its core a bunch of uh, Southern white voters whose main thing is anti-civil rights. So mm. that's, um, that's, I think, a development with a lot of potential. I don't know how it's going to work out, but I feel like taking over that party and pushing it in the right ways, uh, you know, the, the present Democratic Party uh, has, has potential. To answer your question, Sabil, do you want to jump uh, in? Yeah, quickly? quickly. So I so appreciate the question. Um, uh, ditto everything Joy said. I'll just add three things really quickly. Um, one is that, and Rashad spoke about this a little bit too. Uh, our most powerful political formation to achieve that uprooting and that transformation is an inclusive, multiracial, bottom-up social movement. And just one example from history: there's, it's not a coincidence that it's the CIO, which as the first uh, multiracial like kind of mass labor union uh, forms a left flank of the New Deal coalition and is pressing FDR to actually do a bunch of the stuff that now we celebrate FDR for doing. That's mm -hmm. one. Number two, okay. uh, uh, yeah, lessons for today, right? Um, yep. Number two uh, is a lot of times those newer technologies of control and exploitation are in fact tested out and pioneered, so to speak, on communities of color. Right, so um, you think about like predatory finance, for example, and the way in which those technologies of extraction start in communities of color and then metastasize across the economy. Right, like there's a real way in which we ignore that. Not not only does that do harm to communities of color to set, turn a blind eye to that, but we as a larger society ignore that at our peril. And then the last thing is sort of the um, what uh, Joy alluded to is that um, race neutral uh, political strategies aren't enough. Because what we're up, we're uh, up against sort of decades of very well honed um, kind of race baiting, racializing strategies on the other side that is using race to divide us from our strongest form of ourselves. Okay, um, I'm going to ask one final question, um, and then we're going to turn it over to Barry, who's going to introduce the next panel. Um, if we just to bring what has been a really cool, deep historical conversation all the way up to the present oh. moment and talk about maybe, you know, where you see progress, where you see opportunity in some of the current cases that are being brought by the DOJ and the FTC. Um, I wrote a column. I was actually really impressed with Cantor's um, DO, uh, Google case um, in asking for a jury trial because I thought, hey, that's that's interesting. That's a whole different kind of antitrust conversation. So that's something I've been thinking about. Are there other things that you all would bring in, either opportunities or challenges that you see? You know, I, I guess one thing that strikes me when I listened to Senator Warren earlier um, is that there's there's a lot to be said for being a little more concrete uh, and talking about these particular industries and not being sort of overly like there's a tendency for academics, especially economists, also the rest of us in academia, to want to talk about things like antitrust and competition and even democracy at a really high level. Mm -hmm. But when you see like where Warren went with, uh, you know, let's talk about right to repair and let's talk about, you know, uh, the poaching, uh, anti-poaching uh, new regulation, which I think is fantastic, just like with, through the example of McDonald's. Um, and when you even listen, you know, Joe Biden in his State of the Union, he even works in, you know, these little resort fees. And, and everyone scoffs, <laughs> like, what are you doing talking about that in a massive State of the Union address? But there's a reason. I think people appreciate the concrete. Um, and so this is not actually a great answer to your question about which cases. I would say, though, that uh, that keeping the focus on this level where we can ask, is this really a kind of uh, competition that... Um, that uh, is what we want to see in a particular industry. That's that's the level to to argue on. Okay, last minute yeah, to you, Sabiel. right? Very quickly. Thanks. So, uh, so uh, two things I'd add to that. One, in terms of the opportunity. So, um, uh, having just uh, uh, come off of two years of uh, government service in the White House, I will just say that um, uh, we we do have a tremendous opportunity about uh, trying to govern with these ideas. And of course, we heard from Jonathan and and you know FTC is doing great work. But I think across the board, sort of 
finding new ways to sort of press that advantage through regulation, through and through the kind of public advocacy that makes kind of forces that regulation to happen, I think is uh, a continued opportunity even going into these next two years um, that this this room will be really important in advancing. I think the other thing, the challenge we haven't talked about uh, yet very much, but we'll say you know um, uh, sooner rather than later, uh, we will encounter the problem uh, in the courts, mm. and and that is something that you know needs a broader conversation. Um, you know, the, the periods of reform activity we talked about before were also periods of very explicit um, uh, calls for a very different kind of judiciary mm. in, a, as part of the larger de- vision for a democratic uh, economy and, and, and polity. And that's something that, you know, we need to think about. Okay, well, maybe that's for renewing the Democratic Republic uh, 2024. Yes, um, but I'm feeling super smug because our historical panel is right on time. You guys rock. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.